Good morning to everyone. Um, glad you guys kind of came out. Uh, obviously, it's Thursday, so a little late in the week to, uh, to be doing some of these talks. A lot of people I know certainly could be pretty burned out at this point. So to, uh, to kind of lighten the mood, uh, we are actually going to do a, a little bit of a bottle giveaway to, uh, to, to kind of have a little bit of fun with this. So essentially, this is High West Double Rye Whiskey. You'll see how this is sort of a bit incorporated into the presentation. It's out of uh, Utah, which no one thinks Utah has alcohol, but we do. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, if you tweet a, uh, tweet a picture of your favorite slide, um, tag it the uh, proper Twitter way with uh, at uh, S1P and at solace.com, then uh, you'll, at the very end, we'll pick one of you to actually take uh, this bottle home. So, uh, so essentially, kind of I, I came to Solace about eight months ago. Previously, I was a customer, and, and I'm responsible for our Pivotal Cloud Foundry and microservices uh, uh, strategy. And so I kind of said, okay, well, if I'm going to be switching my architecture over to using microservices, these are sort of the attributes that we really want to have as part of uh, this sort of digital transformation. Uh, digital transformation. And so essentially, you know, we all want scalability. That's one of the big reasons a lot of people choose to go into microservices architectures. Um, you know, certainly horizontal scaling, dynamic scaling, and shock absorption can all be a big thing. And, and actually, shock absorption was a new term to me when I came to Solace. And it really revolves around the idea that, you know, you have irregular bursts of traffic. Um, let's say that you're a major e-commerce site and it's Black Friday, you're obviously going to have huge spikes in demand versus just a typical day um, <clears throat> in the middle of, say, July, right? So the ability to sort of deal with shock absorption and have fault tolerance where if something does go wrong, you aren't losing units of work, you can have them retried. You need to certainly have performance, especially where user interaction is sort of um, dictating your performance, and you know, if something takes a long time to respond, people kind of give up. They uh, they essentially will go to another another e-commerce site. They'll use a different thing. Um, <clears throat> Service execution can't exceed plan timing. So I worked on previously a big satellite ground system where we were taking massive amounts of data that we had to do a lot of science algorithms on. And certainly if, if you had a, a performance issue, you actually just had to start dumping data, which, which was against our SLAs. Uh, finally, certainly manageability and security are key as well. So if you kind of aren't getting some of these aspects, you know, certainly your microservices architecture is, has some flaws in it. <clears throat> So I'm going to tell sort of my journey through using microservices here at Solace, actually with a real story which ties in the whole whiskey thing, right? So earlier in the year, I was actually in Scotland with my wife, and, and we went to this place in Edinburgh where, where you could essentially do all these different flights of whiskeys and taste like kind of what you wanted. And so I found this certain whiskey, uh, Dalmore King Alexander III, and thought, hmm, I wonder if I can buy this in Utah. That's where I live. And, you know, everyone kind of thinks, like I, I mentioned before, that Utah doesn't have alcohol. We do, just not maybe as much as other places. So essentially, um, the, the alcohol, the way that you buy alcohol in Utah is all actually controlled by the state liquor store, which is a, a state-run government agency. But they do provide two little web applications that I use a lot. Uh, one is the online price list. It's every product that's ever been in stock in the state of Utah an inventory query where you can actually look up dynamically for a given product, where is it located and how many bottles are in stock. So there I am in Scotland using my uh, Chrome browser on my phone trying to determine if they had it. And so from an online price list perspective, this kind of gives an example of the kind of data that you get back. Uh, essentially, you know, we've got the, uh, the product name, we have the price, and we have some other garbly goop here, which we'll use later. As you can see, though, King Alexander wasn't, uh, wasn't in the list. Kind of a bummer. Um, what inventory query data looks like is actually a screen that looks very much like this. So this is Dalmore uh, 15 year. It's 136 bucks, so a little bit on the pricey side. And these are the five stores that carry it, along with the actual quantities that are in stock in the store. So it, it makes it nice that you can sort of look up exactly what you want before you kind of go through this aimless search all around the city trying to find something. So that's kind of nice. So essentially the outcome was, I wonder if I could sort of build an application or microservices architecture, since I am responsible for that at Solace, that actually could tell me when it was last in stock, which means I have to take sort of a, a historical view of, of inventory 
and be notified when it actually comes into stock so that I don't have to sort of weekly or monthly remember, hmm, let me go see if they finally have gotten it. To this date, by the way, that was earlier this year, they still don't have it, so. So essentially, what the high-level architecture really kind of ends up looking like is, is the way I think a lot of people's architecture looks, uh, looks today, where essentially they sort of have um, what I would call kind of a legacy on-premise environment. Uh, certainly, from the looks of those web pages, they kind of look like old technology kind of legacy pages. So I, I kind of make them a bit of my scapegoat here and say it's a legacy environment running on-premise. Um, you might have a, a GCP cloud provider that you're using. Maybe you're running Pivotal Cloud Foundry because that's where you want to run your microservices. So these little, little uh, shapes here represent you know, databases and, and, and sort of microservices. And then increasingly, a lot of our customers are running in multiple clouds. You know, maybe they're running their workloads in GCP, but they're wanting to use analytics capabilities in the Amazon cloud. So in this case, I'm going to use Elasticstack. Um, to, uh, to sort of do analytics on the products that are, that are uh, that, you know, basically all that data that we could have saw kind of ingested into, into Elasticstack. So I think kind of like most folks, I kind of went out and I, I, I searched all through the, uh, through the web to determine, okay, how should I really be building these things? I was, I was new to Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, I read a whole lot of different Martin Fowler and, and, and different articles on how to properly build these microservices. So I said, okay, I'm gonna basically use REST. Uh, I'm gonna be all in on REST because heck, even Wikipedia says that microservices should use technology agnostic protocols like REST. So essentially what we did is I have, a, I have two microservices here. I have the, uh, the, the, the client um, and the client is the piece that actually initially goes and gets the online price list. So that big long list of, of all of the products, it, it's not a REST service sadly, I'm literally doing screen scraping. And so that business logic circle is actually just screen scraping logic and basically taking that data and making it into a JSON document. From there, I use the uh, Spring REST template to, uh, to basically send that out over to the, uh, the inventory service. So for each of those 14,000 products that we've ever had, I essentially do a query against the, uh, the state database and uh, more screen scraping activity uh, ensues. And then we're able to invoke a REST endpoint actually that uh, Logstash can have uh, to actually ingest that data down into, uh, to be able to do, to do analytics. So this actually all worked, but it, it had sort of uh, a set of issues that I'm sure a lot of you think are probably pretty obvious. We're at a developers conference, but, but first issue was, you know, the, the client, because essentially it's a series of synch uh, synchronous calls, um, you know, if there were any performance issues, downtime, upgrades that are occurring to the inventory microservice, uh, happening external to me with the, uh, the inventory query or a downtime in the elastic stack, uh, my client is basically going to really start to, uh, to, to have issues processing. Um, it, it basically can time out and have some, some, a whole host of different issues. Um, the next issue was obviously with Pivotal Cloud Foundry, it kind of gives you the ability to do some amount of service discovery for things that are running within Pivotal Cloud Foundry, but since Elasticstack was running externally, and in fact, so was the inventory query, you know, how do I write in my application where these endpoints actually are? Sure, I can have external configurations, I could put it into VICAP services as a user provided service, but it, nothing really felt all that elegant. Uh, third is certainly we have a lot of tight coupling here. Um, you know, we've kind of mentally made this decision that the client microservice needs to call the inventory microservice, the inventory microservice needs to, to, uh, to send its, its outputs onto Elasticstack. But, you know, a great example is what if I wanted that pricing data uh, that actually was coming out of this microservice to go to Elasticstack as well? Well, now I've got to sort of crack open this microservice, add additional invocations to it. Uh, it's just, uh, it, it's not really all that elegant again. And then third, and this was actually my biggest concern for all of this is, since I was, had no sort of filtering logic in this inventory, I, you know, my premise was I'm really interested in whiskeys. It's not to say I don't like wine or beer or other things, because I certainly do, but the whole premise of this was I wanted to just deal with whiskeys. So in this, I would have to add sort of content filtering in this microservice to say only whiskey products do I really want to go out and query. 
Um, and the reason why this was an issue was I was really starting to worry that the state of Utah would think that I was basically gonna be part of a denial of service attack because 14,000 products is kind of a lot of, of things to be constantly querying from the same IP address within a very small amount of time. So I kind of decided that to stop, you know, this wasn't the right approach to go. Certainly, I do, of course, work for Solace, which is a messaging company, and so I kind of thought, hmm, this is really interesting because I feel like a lot of people kind of make REST about everything, and REST is a great tool to have sort of in your toolbox, but, uh, you know, in this case, REST has sort of, I think, become a bit of a hammer in the industry, and certainly not everything is a nail. And so, you know, we actually in our product support REST, so I'm not here to sort of just bash REST or, or make a big deal that you shouldn't be using REST, because it does, it is good for certainly where you have synchronous interactions in your architecture, as well as externally facing APIs. Certainly things like historically, like Swagger has made, you know, the, the uh, description of REST uh, interfaces really, really easy. But it does bring some of the baggage, and I think we've seen some of that um, as we sort of gone, have gone through the very beginning part of this presentation. First, it brings about blocking. Um, just like I said before, you have all these sort of synchronous interactions all lined up, so you've got a, a whole chain of blocking uh, invocations. You have the service coupling problem where you sort of are inherently saying that these services are all tied together in sort of a serial sort of methodology. And then kind of the whole complex failure scenarios and is it really, whose responsibility is it to deal with um, when services are being upgraded and they're down, you know, how long should I wait to retry? Should I start doing exponential back off? All of these sort of things start to clutter up your, uh, your, uh, your microservices, which the whole premise of microservices was to have small in size, single in purpose microservices. So I kind of contend that if you have to write a whole bunch of logic all about how a downstream service could behave in off nominal scenarios, that it's actually not single in purpose anymore. So the solution, I think, to a lot of this is to think more event-driven. Um, and essentially, you know, all microservices have inputs and outputs. If, if they didn't have inputs and outputs, they would be pointless services. Um, and so essentially, you know, here's the definition of an event. I stole it certainly uh, from the, the, uh, the, the great source of Wikipedia. And so essentially, it's just an action or occurrence, and your software can choose to recognize it or choose not to recognize it. And so the key is, I think, in that, that third main bullet is to stop thinking about services invoking services, because you, sort of as a microservice designer, you shouldn't be so opinionated, in my opinion, of what um, and how these microservices could be sort of orchestrated together. Instead, if you just think about, okay, I'm gonna take in a certain type of event and I'm gonna produce a certain type of event, well, that event could be picked up by zero downstream services, it could be picked up by one, it could be picked up by many services. And so then you don't have it, all of these sort of uh, having to go back and update your microservices. It's just doing what it was supposed to do. It's, it's taking an event, maybe doing enrichment, maybe it's doing some lookups, some combinations, et cetera, and then it's able to just emit uh, events itself. So essentially, as I put here, you know, what do we admit these events to? Well, certainly messaging, right? So whether that be RabbitMQ or you could use Kafka or preferably you use Solace because we do have a lot of advantages. I'm not gonna make this into a sales pitch, but certainly uh, check us out. Um, so if we kind of go back to the, uh, the online price list data where I said before there was sort of this garbly goop. Um, this actually, makes up of a topic hierarchy in of itself, right? So A actually stands for spirits, uh, W stands for whiskey, so yes, and then R stands for blends, S is scotch, they have bourbons, et cetera, et cetera, right? So now we're able to actually do content filtering based off of our topic hierarchy. So in solace parlance, we basically just apply a topic string as a piece of metadata to a message, and we're able to do millions of topic matches per second, so we're very, very efficient uh, in doing topic matching. <clears throat> so essentially, the better way, and this is actually what I have running today, is, um, Essentially, we have the same outcome with we have the client and we have the inventory provider, but we also have now the, uh, the Solace uh, messaging 
for uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So we actually have a tile that you can run and deploy in Pivotal Cloud Foundry. We actually also have purpose-built hardware appliances that could do millions of uh, messages per second guaranteed. We also, as of this week, have a uh, messaging as a service option called Solace Cloud. And Solace Cloud is essentially sort of to compete with the SQSs and SNSs where you wanna be able to make use of messaging, but you don't wanna have to stand up the infrastructure yourself. So any of those options really could be used here. Uh, since this is a, a, a spring conference and a lot of folks use Pivotal Cloud Foundry, we thought it would be, we'd be good to, uh, to show it this way. In fact, we actually, for the demo that you'll see today, uh, this is actually running in, uh, in PKS, Pivotal Container Service, so in Kubernetes. So essentially, we still have to do the HTTP post to get the online price list. Um, nothing's changed there. But instead of using the REST template, we can now use Spring JMS template. Coming soon for us, actually, you'll be able to use Spring Cloud Streams to do the same kind of thing as well. Um, but essentially, we can now publish this to a topic called product forward slash, you know, in this case, just XYZ, which kind of represents that uh, A for spirits, W for whiskey, um, S for, for scotch or single malt. So then what uh, we're able to do is we're able to have this inventory microservice here use a uh, spring message listen container configured to consume off of this queue. And, and the reason why we wanna use a queue here is, is actually in, uh, in Solace land, we sort of have this capability where you can have queues subscribe to, uh, to topics. So essentially what that allows you to do is this queue is gonna consume every uh, spirit and whiskey product that ever comes through but we're able to now scale this guy up uh, horizontally in a non-exclusive way. So essentially do round robin load balancing to these different uh, inventory services to, to have better performance. Uh, we still have to do the uh, invoking of the inventory query and do that business logic related to screen scraping, but now we'll republish that the outcome events, those inventory uh, pieces of data off to the, uh, to the Solace uh, messaging provider here but we now use a new prefix. We use the inventory prefix because in our initial design, right, we only wanted the things to go to Elk or Elastic Stack to be those inventory uh, um, components. And so we in Solace, we support the, uh, the greater than wild card so that you don't have to sort of explicitly state all of the different options. I don't even know how many different whiskey products there were. So by being able to use wild cards, this is uh, made very, very simple. So then, to get the data into Elastic Stack, we have a component in Solace called a REST delivery point. And what that really is, is it's an integration mechanism that allows you to essentially uh, have a REST delivery point consume off of a queue, just like that microservice, but basically do a REST post to any REST service, right? So essentially, we do the REST post into Elastic Stack, and, uh, and now we've completed that full cycle that we did before, but with a lot of benefits because you know, we, we now are only consuming and, and doing inventory queries on, on whiskey products. Uh, the inventory service has no, no notion that Elastic Stack even exists. The client, this uh, product data could actually just be added to the, uh, the queue subscription here and now his data is going into Elastic Stack. And ultimately, even the client in the inventory, they don't even know about the existence of each other. Simply consuming, uh, this guy's generating events from an outside uh, entity, and this guy's simply taking an event and then producing new events. So that was kind of the premise of, of why I had said uh, very early on to sort of think more, think more about the um, generating and in, in, in consuming events versus thinking about actually doing service invocations. So one of the things that we realized, um, in fact, my boss realized this very quickly from a, a price perspective, was that uh, while all of this functionally works, uh, the link here uh, between cloud providers is actually can be pretty expensive. Um, turns out that some cloud providers, uh, the amount of, you know, it's kind of free to put your data into the cloud, but you pay money to have data go out of the cloud. And that, that cost can certainly add up over time. Um, in fact, 
yeah, it wasn't a good month after I had run this for, for the entire month and, and kind of how much data I was kind of putting over into Elasticstack. So the key to this sort of picture is, is that, you know, we, we are actually supporting kind of a whole bunch of different options here. You know, it's, we have kind of a legacy to cloud data movement uh, use case. We're doing cloud to cloud net, uh, uh, data movement. We're also supporting a platform as a service here. So our microservices within, within uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry are able to make use of messaging. And the key, of course, is so Solace can actually be deployed in all of the clouds as well as on on-prem environments. And, and, and strategically here, what we are able to do is actually um, fix the network cost problem by using a um, by using a bridge. And a bridge is really the, the Solace terminology for being able to sort of connect up multiple of our brokers together and, and kind of do data federation. But we also provide out-of-the-box compression of those messages. So in the case of my uh, pieces of data, which were JSON documents, um, we actually have statistics that you can keep track of in real time as to how much of what is basically the compression ratio of the data. And so we are actually saving about 80% on, um, on our bandwidth by just being able to do compression. So of course, there's a cost calculation any organization would actually do of, okay, well, what's the cost to run Solace versus what's the cost of, of, that, uh, of that network piece? But it does give you options and flexibility that uh, otherwise you wouldn't really have. So really, I think this is sort of the summary for the entire deck here is that um, you know, there are a lot of benefits to sort of thinking more event-driven, especially with microservices. Um, by using messaging technology, and messaging has been around for obviously a, a whole long time, messaging has helped with distributed systems for, for decades. Um, and really, microservices are sort of creating pretty complex distributed systems where you need high amounts of throughput, you need high performance, you need guaranteed message delivery, and all of these things is really what messaging excels in. Right, so the benefits as we saw, I think, uh, includes you know, basically limited service to service coupling. You know, you're always gonna have data level coupling. You know, it, it's just sort of the reality of, of, of how things are, but you shouldn't necessarily sort of, again, have that opinion of how should your services sort of be orchestrated and choreographed together. That's where the whole event-driven architecture kind of comes into play. Um, Additionally, you know, you can have no impact service upgrades because as a service, as a microservice is being upgraded, the messaging tier, uh, because you chose event-driven, really is responsible for, uh, <clears throat> it's really responsible for holding onto those messages so that when the service comes back up after an upgrade, it's able to process all the data that it had missed in the meantime. Um, it's easy to create new services. I actually did this entire uh, architecture in about three days, so it's not like, in fact, most of the work was, was probably getting uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry installed the first time, but once I had that, it was really easy to create Spring Boot applications, use the built-in features of Spring in order to, uh, to uh, basically link up these different microservices. And coming soon, as I mentioned, right, once we have Spring Cloud Streams, it'll be even easier. Uh, we're much more resilient to service failures because we do have that sort of shock absorption mechanism in the middle of our system where we can write data per and persist it um, and then kind of come back to it uh, after the service comes back up. It's more resource efficient because you know, if you kind of think of sort of a, a chain of invocations, um, if you're, you're basically only as good as your weakest link, so you kind of have to scale all of the services in front of that in order to, uh, to scale and compensate for that one misbehaving downstream service, whereas this allows you to sort of, in a very fine grain, scale up individual microservices much easier. Uh, and, but I think there are some challenges. I mean, certainly when we talk to a lot of our customers, which you know, are actually a fair amount of Fortune 500 companies, um, they really struggle because I think in a lot of ways, some developers really think in a synchronous way. Everything to them is sort of a function call that should return almost immediately, but certainly with distributed systems, that isn't always the case. And then being able to do correlation uh, can be a challenge if you're having to sort of take multiple disparate events and have to sort of tie them all together in order to, uh, to, to, to produce a new piece of data. That we, there's certainly you know, the ability to do correlation IDs and all of those kind of things, but it's, you gotta kind of think through the problem a bit. So that is really sort of what I wanted to talk to you guys all about today. Um, you know, certainly come talk to us at our, uh, at our booth 
uh, booth number six. Uh, I know it's getting late, and we all are probably going to be catching some flights this afternoon. But you know, talk to us about event-driven architecture. You know, talk to us about Spring Cloud Streams and what we're going to be doing in that. Uh, you know, in our binder to support that. Um, you know, talk to us about Pivotal Cloud Foundry if you're a Pivotal Cloud Foundry customer. Uh, definitely go to uh, cloud.sauce.com forward slash sign up if you want to try out our, uh, our messaging as a service offering for free. You can actually do one million messages a month for free and uh, no charge. We don't even take your credit card. Um, and certainly ask us how we compare to Kafka or Rabbit or ActiveMQ or any of the sort of legacy technology providers that are out there. So that is the conclusion of my presentation. Hopefully, someone on the Solace team has been looking at the, the tweets that you guys and, and pictures so that I can give away this, uh, this bottle of whiskey. So um, someone from the Solace team want to come up and, and announce who uh, had a good picture? All right, come on up, Amy. <clears throat> Enjoy, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think we have a couple of minutes if we have uh, any questions in the room for anything that I presented. If not, then certainly come and, and vis visit us at the, uh, the Solace booth. Sure. So actually, Solace isn't deployed in the Elastic Runtime. It's actually deployed on VMs, all managed by Bosch. So essentially, if you went to PivNet, downloaded the tile, essentially it, it runs a service broker in the Elastic Runtime, but it actually, depending on what, what options you picked in the marketplace, deploys those on just the, the infrastructure as a service that, that Pivotal Cloud Foundry is running on. Sure, so he asked uh, what, what the rationale was for deploying um, the Solace messaging capability in the Elastic Runtime instead of just as, v as VMs, right? Yeah, so he, he's asking about if you need to sort of access the Solace service from outside of PCF, how, how we sort of do that. So because everything is sort of managed by Bosch and it's all running within the same IaaS, it's getting IP addresses and stuff that is actually local to, uh, local to the sort of internal PCF network. And so what we actually have done at Solace is we utilize the TCP routes feature of Cloud Foundry. So essentially when you go into our ops manager and use, it, well into the ops manager and use, you, can, you can configure what ports, whether it be AMQP or MQTT, et cetera, that you want accessible from outside of PCF, you basically just uh, say yes or no to those ports. And essentially we dynamically create the routes that are addressable on the outside and map them into our internal ports and IP addresses. So we, we do support fully whether you're wanting to access Solace from within uh, PCF or you're wanting to access it from outside of PCF. And that actually is a, is a great use case um, and capability we provide because we do support MQTT for IoT uh, use cases. We've had a lot of customers that have, you know, for instance, millions of connected cars uh, access Solace's service and then have microservices running in PCF that, um, that can consume the data via AMQP or JMS or, or whatever the protocol that, that you choose. So I think I'm, I'm out of time. I'm, I'm getting, the, getting the rope here. So, uh, so thanks, guys. If you have any other questions, come to the uh, Solace booth. <laughs>